thank you for inviting me to present some DFT results about um, the understanding of organic inhibitors and metal surfaces uh, applied to aluminum and copper surfaces. Okay, you all know that uh, aluminum alloys are very used in many applications and that they are uh, prone to corrosion. That's why we are all here looking for solution, solutions. And um, aluminum alloys contain copper and there is a problem of microstructures, especially, for example, AL2CU microstructures. And this is why when we are uh, looking for solutions for aluminum corrosion, we also are looking for solutions for copper because uh, we know that the copper rich zones are those where the alloy is um, uh, pitting, for example, susceptible to pitting. So uh, in this context, uh, in our group, we use a combined approach. It is a model approach, both experimental and uh, based on DFT calculations, so at the atomic scale. And for example, what in our approach, we study pure metals before studying alloys. And uh, what we do is that we do uh, corrosion tests and then we do a surface characterization of uh, the um, uh, mod uh, metal uh, after, before and after corrosion. And also we try to um, study the uh, organic uh, inhibitors. So we study the adsorption of these organic inhibitors on the surfaces. And what we try to do with DFT is to build uh, models that are representative of the alloys of the metal surface and also of the adsorption of the molecule of the inhibitor on the surface. So what and then we try to link this surface characterization with corrosion um, inhibition relationship. So I will talk uh, of the screening of inhibitors uh, on aluminium, pure aluminium, this was part of um, uh, uh, M-Eranet project with a Slovenian team, Ingrid Milosev and Anton Kokalj. And I will also talk about the adsorption of uh, a known inhibitor, MBT, to Mercato benzotiazole on copper. And this is part of the ERC uh, project of Philippe Marcus, which is called Simnas. So for the uh, mRNA project, CORIDE, uh, our aim was to screen uh, several families of potential uh, inhibitors. And we, we started from a very simple idea. The very simple idea was that we have here the metal, the metal that can be oxidized. We will see that uh, later. And we have an anchor group, which is uh, function, uh, chemical function, which is responsible for the attachments, the anchoring to the surface. And then we have uh, a chain here, which shows alkyl chains. And these should be responsible to doing a self-assemble layer, a sum, and to protect the metal from entry of, uh, of corrosive uh, species. And uh, in fact, we studied uh, key f the key factors of the nature of the anchor group and the effect on adsorption and on inhibition and the effect of the chain lengths. So what about corrosion resistance? Um, in fact, we found four families uh, with doing electrochemistry. We found four families. The first families were corrosion activators, so molecules that are deleterious. For example, here you have these two, which are um, IMI, this uh, nitrogen molecule. It is less, less good than the, the témoin, the witness, the blank, sorry. And we, you have... Um, uh, molecules that have no effect, whatever the change size. You have molecules which effective net depends on the change size, 
and you have molecules which are always good for corrosion inhibition. For example, phosphonates are always good, whatever the change size. Carboxylates can be either without effect or without a very good effect, with a very good effect, depending on the change size. And other molecules, as we said, are do nothing. So we did surface analysis. And it is not surprising, but it is nice to do it with systematic. The molecules that have no effect on corrosion inhibition are those that do absolutely do not adsorb. Here you have the XPS results, and you see on the, um, the element that is the fingerprint of the molecule that there is nothing. So no adsorption, no inhibition. Then uh, we studied carboxylic acid, and uh, with tough seams, we could evidence that the molecules are present totally in the surface, which in their entire mass. For example, this is octanoic acid, and this is uh, stearic acid, and there are on the surface that is very clear uh, with comparison with a reference sample. And with the XPS, we confirm that there is adsorption. And uh, we could, uh, with, um, with, uh, uh, with XPS, we could do um, quantitative treatment of the, in, of the intensity. And we found that with the uh, stearic acid, there is a full layer adsorbed on the surface. And, but, but for the C8, for the stearic uh, octanoic acid, the layer was not fully, um, the surface was not fully covered with the molecule. And here, if you look at the electrochemical curves, with the, uh, where all the carboxylic acids are studied depending on the chain size, you can see that there is a threshold and you have to have molecules more than, it begins at C14, to have a very good effect. Otherwise, for example, C10, you have no effect. And we, we, we could link that with the fact that, for example, for the C8, only 80% of the surface was covered, whereas for the C18, the full surface was covered. But we, we wanted to go uh, more in detail in the understanding, and we performed uh, DFT calculation. Well, I think you all know that aluminum is a metal that is prone to oxidation, so it is nearly always oxidized. This is why we built it, instead of studying with DFT, uh, the metal, sorry, we studied the metal covered with an hydrox uh, oxide hydroxide layer. What we, I don't enter, enter into detail, but we, we, keep, we took gamma alumina as a model of oxide. It is a model. And we put uh, hydroxide layer above it. And we studied several thicknesses. What we found is that when the oxide is ultra thin, it has no insulator um, character. These are the electronic density of states of the of the um, oxide, and the, whereas when the oxide is a little thicker, we recover the band gap of, not exactly the band gap of the bulk alumina, but we recover a band gap. So here we have insulator or, yes, nearly insulator character. Here we have a metallic character of the, of, of the this means that the, the oxide has not uh, protected the metal, and see, we will see just right now, because on this very ultra thin film, if we put oxygen, this is DFT calculations, so it is uh, in silico reactions. So with the transfer of one electron, or even more, when we go on uh, to the oxygen, and at the end we have uh, per water peroxide, and we can go on until water. So in fact. What we do is that we, we have the cathodic reaction uh, corrosion, uh, which is one of the corrosion reactions. And this is due to the fact that the, uh, the oxide is 
allows the, trans the electronic transfer to the oxygen E here, molecule, and this does not happen on the thicker film. So, this is important because if one uh, inhibitor uh, adsorbs, it has absolutely to adsorb even on the oxide because sometimes the oxide is not protecting. And this, we, so we used this model and we studied all the molecules that you have seen. I don't enter into the detail, but fortunately, we found that the molecules that are not active in, for inhibitors are also those not, we, we, where we found that they don't make a bond with aluminum. So this is uh, endothermic, whereas the molecules that are inhibitors, they, their adsorption is exothermic. And uh, so we had a good agreement between calculations and experiments. And we wanted to go a little step forward. And we wanted to, to understand with more details why, for example, the C8 is not, is, uh, does not adsorb uh, on the wool surface. And instead, the C18, for example, uh, makes a wool layer on the surface. And in fact, what happens when you, you have this, uh, this carboxylic acid uh, on the surface is that at the beginning, when the chain is very small, in fact, the, the, the tilting of the natural, I would say, tilting of the, the, the chains is not possible here because uh, they are too short. And in fact, they are more disturbing each other for steric effect than helping each other. So the, the energy of adsorption decreases, so it, it is more and more ex exothermic, but it is not maximal. Instead, after some a certain length, there is an optimal arrangement of the uh, uh, alkyl chains, like in polyethylene, like in a, in a uh, free sum. And here we have a second uh, regime, linear regime, and here we see that longer the alkyl chain, more exothermic is the adsorption to the surface. It is, in fact, it is simply due to the fact that uh, the alkyl are self-assembling and giving energy to the, to the wool organic layer. A little more, um, if we look at the, the effect of the alkyl chain length on the tilt angle, which is uh, very important for in the stabilization of the sum, we see that if the change is small, it is a mess. You don't find a very well. It is, it is, you don't find any effect of the angle, or it is difficult. Whereas more longer the chain length here, for example, for C11, now you have a very nice uh, stabilization of the sum with a tilt angle, and this is why, for example, for C1 you have no tilt angle. For C size, you have 30 degrees of tilt angle, and if you go to C17, you arrive to 40 degrees of tilt angles. And the second effect of that is that when the molecules are well tilted, you cover the entire surface. Instead, when they are, they are smaller, they, they, there is places in the surface which are not covered. So the effective coverage increases with chain length. OK, uh, another effect of the chain length and the adsorption of those molecules is that when these, these molecules are stabilizing the oxide, and in fact, the, the, the insulator capacity, uh, the insulator properties are recovered and this um, is good because there will be no more uh, cathodic uh, reaction. And moreover, we also studied the effect of the chain size uh, on the chloride penetration into the sum towards the, the metal. So here is the metal. Here is the distance to the metal, and here is the sum thickness. So for example, at 6 angstrom, you have uh, 3 carbon, 
And here you have the 18, okay, uh, to 24 angstroms from the surface. And this is a, a simple electrostatic model. Um, that, and this simple electro electrostatic model was just made by considering that into the sum you have not the same permittivity as into water, which is uh, known. And so um, these are the barriers for penetration from the chloride, for the chloride to the surface of the metal. And you can see that when the chain size increases, the barrier increases. And this is due to two things. The first is that when uh, coming from water and entering into the sun, chloride lost his solvation energy. And this, because the solvation energy in water is much higher, of course, than in an organic medium. So to, to put chloride into the organic layer, you lose chloride solvation, first thing. And the second thing is that you cannot, or difficult, with difficulty, put sodium, Na plus, in the sum because the, its solvation energy is very high. So it is very endothermic to put it in the sum. So it is less endothermic to let sodium outside the sum and put chloride into the sum. But in, at this moment, you have increase of Na plus cell, dis, cell minus distance. And this makes a huge uh, hindrance. And this is the reason of this hindrance. So smaller the sum, uh, if the sum is smaller, Na plus is here. And so you, you have a not so long Na plus cell, moin, uh, cell minus distance. And the hindrance is not so long, so, so high. But high, uh, longer the same size and higher is, a, is a, the barrier for penetration. So here we show we can really we can uh, link this result with the fact that when you increase the chain size, even if you have 100% of the surface covered, you have a better inhibition power. And uh, we went still a little step forward, and it is for at the present moment the last step that we did in this uh, study. We also studied the same. So chloride penetration into the organic layer, into the sum layer until the surface, but this time with DFT. These calculations uh, are very costly, very difficult. We, 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 must, we were obliged to study um, double size uh, cells. I don't, I don't enter into the detail, but here you have the, the counter cation, it can be Na plus or here Mg2 plus because we have a double cell. Here you have chloride in the solvent. Here you have the organic layer and we studied penetration of chloride until the surface. And we, we focused on the influence of the tilt angle and we used so implicit solvent. And in order to first study the steric hindrance of the sum, we, we, you, we studied uh, xenon, and then we studied chloride. And the result of that is that first for the study of the, the plasticity of the organic layer, you can see that if you, if you study, if you look at the xenon entering at low concentration, here in a perpendicular, in upright sum, there is nearly no barrier. This means that at low concentration, the sum is very mobile and it, it costs nothing to, to make a place for xenon. When the concentration of xenon is higher, you can see that the barrier is higher, the hindrance, because you have to, there is too much xenon and uh, it begins to be a little, uh, so is a barrier, but it's not very high, it's zero to EV. And then when you put xenon in a tilted sum, here you see it is tilted, then the barrier is it's much higher at low concentration. 
Okay, so this is um, because uh, tilt in sum are more dense and more difficult to to to, to um, uh, deform. So then we studied chloride. So if you look at here at low concentration on the upright sum, chloride the barrier is uh, about 0.7 eV, and with uh, the simple uh, electrostatic model I showed you, it should be here. So something wrong. What is wrong is that here we have uh, upright chains and chloride goes across the organic layer with water. And so we have no more the permittivity of the organic layer here, so with water and chloride is as in water and the, bower, the, the barrier falls down. Instead, here, for example, on the tilt-tilt sum, you recover here the, exactly the same slope as on the, what was predicted with a simple electrostatic model. And this is the sum is dense and it has the permittivity of a real organic sum. So, okay. And um, the conclusion of that is that we have shown that when the change, change sign increases, you, we increase the effective surface coverage and this has the effect that the sum is more dense and it is so more um, protective unless we cannot exclude the fact that locally even these sums can open, of course. But this will be perhaps a, the following study. Unless if they are upright, there is no more barrier. And this, is, this paper is submitted. It is a collaboration with Anton. So in, as a conclusion of this part, uh, I think that DFT is useful in complement to surface science techniques and to electrochemistry to characterize why an inhibitor is efficient. Of course, the experiments were really modeled. So the adsorption energy must be high, and this is the, uh, due to the head group. And so we, it, it is good that the surface coverage is maximized, and this is the effect of the inhibitor chain in our case. And here we showed that uh, it is better that the organic layer is dense and that it allows also to have a proper electronic properties of insulator. Now, um, I, uh, I, I don't know how much time I have still. Eight minutes. Okay. So, I, see, it is a little the same story, so I will get quick until the end where the story goes bad, and this is what I wanted to show you where, uh, an example where it doesn't work. So, here we put uh, MBT on copper, and um, MBT is uh, protective against corrosion of copper. We studied it on metal and on oxide, and we showed that it, is, it absorbs on the metal. Just a word about how, in fact, it, it seems to be easy to put one molecule on one metal surface. In fact, it is very difficult. Why? Because on the metal, you have plenty of sites. And uh, the molecules, they have the tendency to, to self-assemble. And the fact is that you have to find the best epitaxy relationship between hard matter and soft matter. And this is not so easy because soft matter, he likes, they like to, to do very amazing but um, very difficult to imagine uh, organization, self-organization. So um, we, we try to, to answer to this uh, question and um, in fact, if you, um, if you look at here, the adsorption mode of MBT on copper, it can adsorb with two sulfur on the metal or with one sulfur. And here you have the energy 
change with the dense molecule density at the surface, and you can see that there is a minimum. This minimum corresponds to the optimal lateral interaction between the molecules. And you can see that here, the two sulfur copper bonds are favored over the one. And this is reversed when the, um, the density of molecule increases because then the molecules are, are too many and they tend to, to adapt uh, here. So the, the optimal coverage is that one. So this is just to mention that MBT adsorbs on copper. It adsorbs also on oxide copper. I don't enter into the details, just to show that here it is a little much easier to study because there are less copper available on the oxide than on metal to make a bond. And all the energies are uh, negative, so exothermic. And then we also adsorbed MPT on a uh, hole. So in a place where the metal is discovered and in, in the oxide, and we found that it was favored also. Okay, and what was interesting to see is that so where goes MBT in this case? First, it goes into the oxide edge where the um, coordinations of the atoms are the minimal, which are the most reactive places, and then it goes on the oxide surface and it covers finally all the surface. So this is to show that uh, MBT can heal uh, weak zones on copper. So the conclusion of this study uh, is that MBT can cover the wool surface, the metal surface, and also the oxide surface. And here, I would like to show an example where it doesn't, it seems to not work. Here, a DFT showed that MBT adsorbs on aluminum and it, it makes the same structure as on copper, but it doesn't adsorb on oxide, whatever even making a bond with oxygen of, or aluminum or H bonds, it, it only physisor sorbs. And so we think that physisorption is not uh, exothermic enough to, 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 explain, uh, to explain corrosion inhibition. However, we found an effect of corrosion inhibition of MBT on aluminum here. You can see that here you have the test. Uh, it is the lost, the lost of uh, weight. Here it's a reference. And with MBT, uh, sorry, it's here. With MBT, you have an important effect of MBT, it, even after 20 days of immersion. After, um, immer after uh, 24 hours and 72 hours of immersion, we found MBT at the surface. But the XPS analysis uh, were very uh, intriguing because uh, if you have a only oxidized surface, you don't adsorb MBT, and this was predicted by DFT, so with no adsorption on the oxide. This is a bermitized surface of aluminum. But if you put uh, um, and aluminum, you can see that uh, this is the reference where there is no sulfur, but you can see that with time you have increasing of this signal, which is due to MBT. This is due to co-adsorption of sulfates. It is a contaminant. So we, we thought that MBT, in fact, adsorbs only on metal zones and that this can explain the uh, the action of MBT. So in this case, we have an example where the molecule adsorbs only on the metal. We also found some oxidation uh, compounds of MBT here, but absolutely not on the oxide. So in fact, in this case, the inhibitor doesn't cover the wool surface at all, because here we calculated with express intensity that it covers only 5% of the surface. And I think 
this. So, in conclusion, aluminium and copper, um, yeah, the, the corrosion inhibition of aluminium and copper alloys by organic molecules is dependent on the molecule surface interaction. And the, the inhibitor has to absorb at least on the weak zones to protect them. And DFT is, a, I think it's precious to help in interpretation of these molecule surface interactions. And I thank you for your attention. And I acknowledge uh, all, all the people that were involved in all these uh, studies. Thank you. Thank you.